Hello and welcome back to the Rockwood Academy. I am your host David Flanagan and today is another episode of Rockwood Live. A show where we take a look at cloud native software to help assist you make your Kubernetes cloud native microservices lives a little bit easier. Today we have a follow up episode as we take a look at Robusta and specifically we're going to take a look at how Robusta can improve or enhance our monitoring of Kubernetes clusters with Prometheus. <coughs> I'm joining us today. Excuse me, I am sitting in the freezing cold. It's minus five and the heating is broken in my building. I'm just going to get that out there in case I start shivering. Joining us today uh, are two wonderful guests that we've had before, Nathan and Attic. Hey, how's it going? It's going good. Yeah. Thank you for having us back here. <laughs> uh, I tried so hard not to mention that it was freezing cold, but I could already feel my teeth chittering as I talk, so I just, yeah. Just yeah, like I said before this thing, the things that you do for the internet, <laughs> I mean, guys, if you haven't hit that subscribe button. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll just, I'll let you do all the talking today. I appreciate it. <laughs> all right. Uh, for anyone who hasn't seen uh, our last episode or isn't familiar with you both on LinkedIn and Twitter, etc., can you both tell us a little bit about you and what you've been up to? Yeah, so what we do is we do runbook automation for Kubernetes based on Prometheus. And that's a mouthful, so I'm going to break that down with an analogy. So I want to start with a non-technical example that I'll use to explain what this is and why it matters. So let me share my screen. And I'm going to start off with my favorite website on the internet, um, of course, Reddit. And what I have up on here is a subreddit called What Is This Thing? And this is a subreddit where you can go and people go on here and they post pictures of different things. And they say, what is this thing? So like someone here posted a picture of this blue disc that they found in a bag of crisps. I think crisps is British for some kind of snack, but <laughs> yeah, um, it's, it's British for chips. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And they said, what is this thing? And then people go in the comments, they try and guess what something is. And this is a metaphor for something related to Kubernetes, but I'll get there in just a moment. So I want to take an example that someone posted a few years ago. This is a number three post of all time. And someone posted on here, I found this box in the attic and you know, what is this thing? And you look at the box and it says on here, this is radioactive material, route one or two, whatever that means. No person shall remain within one meter of this container unnecessarily. And of course, it's, I guess, in the US, so we translate that to three feet. Um, if you didn't figure out, you should get the hell away from this. And radioactive units of this thing, and so on and so on. And they posted this on Reddit, and everyone on Reddit said, why are you posting this on Reddit? <laughs> the Department of Energy. And the Department of Energy came up to their house, and that's like the guys with the spacesuits. So they have on the spacesuits, and they have that thing that goes beep, the Geiger counter, and they're going all over the place. And the person is certain that he's going to die and he's going to be in a hospital or get like that special iodine or whatever. And after this whole big thing and all this excitement, it turned out that it was all a false alarm and that this box just, just had some old radon paint and radium paint. And for people who aren't familiar with it, then they used to paint watches. So they would go in the dark with this radioactive paint and it wasn't good. And a lot of people got cancer because they worked in the factories and they would lick it. So you shouldn't go around licking this paint, but like if you find it in your attic, you're not going to die. Everything is fine. Nothing happens. And now I don't know. I, I'm, do you, do you want to guess where I'm going with this? <laughs> I'm still wondering what the little blue disc was, but. <laughs> oh, the, the old blue disc is interesting, but it's too far off topic. So I, I recommend <laughs> you talk to afterwards. Uh, me. So, yeah, I'm pretty sure I'm going to spend the next three hours after the stream on this subreddit, just looking through all the most random stuff. But I'll let you get back onto your, your point. I'm embarrassed to admit how many of these links here are purple. So, um, it, yeah, so going back to this though, the point here is that this is really representative of something that happens to us all the time in the world of SRE and DevOps and when we're operating stuff in production. What happens all the time is you get some of them in your Slack channel and it could potentially be really bad. And you want to understand as fast as possible is this an alert that is going to take down my production? Is this something I need to look at right now? Or if it's 3 a.m., can I go back to sleep and just deal with this in the morning? And now when you get to bigger companies, then it's also a matter of responsibility. So just like you yourself didn't know by looking at this box, whether like it was a big deal or not, you had to call up that team with the Geiger counters and with the spacesuits. 
In a big company, you're not always the person who even has the context or the knowledge to look at an alert and understand what to do with it. So what we're trying to do with Robusta is when you see a radioactive box like this, we're trying to say, you know, this box isn't so bad. Like, okay, you'll call up someone, you're disposed of it in a safe manner, but like, it's okay. You can go back to work and relax. Or we're trying to say, you know, this box is actually really bad. Get over your house right now. And that's what we call runbook automation. And in the Kubernetes context, now, if I jump over to like a concrete example, then we're taking Prometheus alerts, like this Prometheus alert that said Pod is crash looping. And we're trying to get you as fast as possible to understand what does this alert mean? Does it mean something? Should I stop everything I'm doing and have people investigate what's going on in production right now? Or is this something like that radioactive box that isn't such a big deal and can wait? Okay, I get it now. I understand the Reddit hook. <laughs> so I have to say, I guess I'm, I'm not going to stop thinking about it. And I'm sure there are other people there who won't stop thinking about it until we say. So that blue thing, the blue chip in the bag, they put the, they do quality control and they like run some blue chip that's, uh, that's metallic through. And then they're supposed to identify all the blue chips and take them out of the process. And if a blue chip escapes the process and gets to the end, then like something was faulty with the equipment. So the blue chip shouldn't have been there, but when the blue chip goes missing, they know one of the machines or like the production lines has broken down. Ah, uh -huh. there we go. Today I learned. Now we can stop thinking about that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah. So uh, David, uh, you've heard a little bit about Robusta before, and you've seen it a little bit. So does this make does it make sense? Uh, yeah, it does make sense. Yeah, I think there's. You know, one of the things I think is really important when it comes to operating Kubernetes, you know, something that I, I do quite a lot is trying to improve the signal to noise ratio, specifically with monitoring, is that it's very easy for you to get alert fatigue for things to be alerting all the time. Um, because you know what? Kubernetes is eventually consistent. Nodes go away, disks go away, everything is completely ephemeral to a certain degree, and that reconciliation process will cause alerts depending on how you have them tweaked. And then something I'm guilty of, I guess, is, well, sometimes I just change the parameters of those alerts so that I'm actually not notified as quickly as I should be, but I'm trying to reduce that noise and just get more um, of the signals. And that's the wrong approach to do it. And I'm really hoping that what you're going to show us today is actually going to give me ways for me to improve that. Um, just so that I get more sleep most of the time, I guess, would be really nice. If you get me more sleep, I'll be a happy man. And I still have the original Robusta t-shirt. I don't know if you're still giving them away the Cube Control Get Sleep, but that thing is great. Yeah, I, like, yeah. I like my sleep. <laughs> you got a UI UX design, so you have to do it a little bit, but we still have some... You're one of the lucky people with the originals. Nice. Yeah. Um, so to, touch, to to just touch on that and to really like about, about what you said, then yeah, it's absolutely a goal. And there's like two challenges. One is what is a good set of default alerts? So we're doing some work there and we're taking existing alerts and trying to put it together into a good collection and to really add on context for like, what does this alert mean? And then the other part of what we're doing is to really like when an alert fires, all the data is there. The problem isn't that the signal isn't there. The problem is that the signal is buried in data. So you don't really need like another monitoring system. You don't need more metrics. You don't need more alerts. Like all the data is there. You don't need more logs. You have all the logs. You just need to see the right data at the right time. So part of like one way you could describe what we're doing is we're doing monitoring orchestration. So we're orchestrating like all your existing monitoring, but putting it together and tying it together in a, to a coherent picture. All right, awesome. Yeah, so I'll just say two quick words about the architecture. And then from there, I think we'll just jump into a live demo. And at the end, maybe we'll jump back over here and I can speak a little bit about what's new since last time for people who have seen this before and uh, what we're going to be doing in the next year. So just to get started, so a quick reminder, when you're using Prometheus, then typically you have a setup where you have Prometheus that generates alerts and that sends them to Alert Manager. And the alert manager has some extra functionality, like grouping the alerts together and waiting a certain amount of time before it forwards them. And then it sends that by webhook to destination like Slack or like MS Teams. And this is the normal setup. And then you get in Slack, you get alerts like this, which are great. And they sometimes indicate real problems, but they don't have context. 
So here you can see an example where you have a crashing pod, but it doesn't have context on why the pod is crashing. And I like to say when all you have is a time series database and everything looks like a time series. So time series databases are excellent at using them to write rules to identify when problems occur. They're not good at telling you why those issues occurred though. So what we're doing with Robust is we're adding on an additional component. We're leaving the first half of this exactly the same. So an alert comes from Prometheus to alert manager. And then instead of going directly to stack, it gets sent to Robusta. And Robusta now has rules that go in the gather data about why that alert fired and what's the context. This is an observability engine here or runbook engine, if you prefer, that knows how to take that alert and correlate it with those Kubernetes objects. So there was an alert on a pod. Go to that pod, look at it, pull in the logs. There was um, a pod that was pending. Go pull in out the kubectl get events. Show me the reason why it's pending. And we have rules here in this observability engine, so we can go and we can gather all the data, and then we just forward it on to destinations like stock. Okay. So the Rumbook engine sets, receives all the alert manager alerts, and then you have some sort of utility. It just goes collect logs and other data, and then forwards them on to a, so the Slack or whatever I want to send those alerts to. So you're just kind of enriching that alert with the information that people need to actually understand if it is signal or noise and what they have to do about it, right? Exactly. And the, in data and the enrichments here, they could be really simple or really complex. It's so like a simple enrichment is a pod is crashing, just fetch the dog for me. So now in stack, I get the alert with that pod's dog. And I'm thinking about like how a big company works. Like now the developer, <coughs> you can route that alert directly to the developer. And even if the developer doesn't know that much about Kubernetes, you can immediately see the dog there. And then you can triage it and decide whether it's a development issue that the developer should look at, or if it's an infra issue that someone from the infrastructure team should look at. So there's simple stuff like dogs. And then there's more complex stuff like um, a pod with CPU throttled, go and look at the memory limits, go and look at, sorry, go and look at the CPU limits, the CPU requests, perform some actual complicated analysis on that and tell me why it happened. So sometimes we're just pulling in right, the right data. And sometimes we're taking like a, a known alert and we're going really deep on that and telling you why it happens. Is this static or dynamic? And like, I mean by that, like, have you already defined what the collection sources are when an alert manager alert triggers? Or is this something that I enrich with my own logic and code? Could I call some arbitrary API? Like, what does this runbook engine look like from my point of view? Oh, excellent question. So what it looks like if you want to go and you want to define stuff yourself, then it looks like just a YAML definition. So you have here a YAML file that says, when there's this Prometheus alert for QPod crash looping, go and reach that with the logs. But most people don't need to do that. So it, you can go and you can add on your own rules. And a big part of our focus in 2023 is can make this even easier and to add on better documentation and to make it super easy to do and to add on your own rules. But out of the box, we define a base set of alerts. Um, if you use Kube Prometheus stack, we define a base set of uh, enrichments for Kube Prometheus stack. And out of the box, we try and give you something that will work for most people that you won't need to fine tune, you won't need to customize at all. All right, cool. And then the last thing I'll say, and then we'll jump right over already to a live demo, is we take in more data, not just from Alert Manager, since the last time that you talk, that we talked, I think, we took over KubeWatch as the official maintainers, and we'll be announcing very soon KubeWatch uh, version two. So this is a utility that was once by I believe Bitnami uh, before it was um, before they stopped maintaining it. That tracks all the different Kubernetes changes by listening to the API server. So we take in data from uh, KubeWatch, so we can see like when an ingress changes, and we can see when uh, pods change, and we can see when jobs fail, and we can get all this data. And we take in data from other sources, like from Elasticsearch. We you can send data. We can take in data from all these sources, not just the dirt manager, and then tie them all together into a coherent picture. But we're mostly going to focus on this today, on the alerts. All right, awesome. Well, I'm excited to play with it. Are we moving over to my screen now? We are, that's it. I'm done talking. <laughs> uh, that means I have to take my hands out my pocket, but we'll do it. So. I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, I have a terminal with a Kubernetes cluster running on JKE. I have two tabs here, one with some demos that you've sent me. So if anyone else wants to check these out in their own time, you can go to github.com slash robusta dash dev, and that is Kubernetes dash demos. 
the other one we've got is just your Robusta. So if you're completely new to Robusta and want to check it out, then go to the Robusta repository. Or the docs. I guess both would work. So, am I... Oh, we should... I should send you to the docs. Well, I was going to say, like, am I just going to go to the docs and deploy Robusta to this cluster? Is it covered in the readmes for the demos? Uh, what, what, no, what's, what's step one? Okay, yeah, so I sent you a, a demo... Re I sent you a demo repository in advance, um, but you should start at, like, the normal Robusta repository. Yep, or just click the big get started button for the docs. Yeah, let's just go straight to the installation, right? So all right, zoom, zoom, zoom. Okay, so we're going to be installing with Helm. Do we need the Robusta CLI? Uh, we do. All right. Do I have pip? <laughs> oh, I think I do. I think it's pip3. There we go. There's another option there that you can just use a Docker container if you don't have pip. Uh, yeah, I, I don't run Docker desktop that often. So I actually don't have access to containers, really. Mm. <laughs> Everything's in Kubernetes now, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, then we're going to do a robust gen config. Oh, there's a nice copy button. Might as well use that. And let's see what this spits out. Okay, do I want to configure a Slack integration? Do we need it for today, or will I say no? I think it would be best. If there's a Slack we can add it to, I think it would be best. Uh, all right. Connect Robusta to Slack. Sure. Nope. Too many Slack channels. Uh, uh, that's why wrong profile. Is that it? Yep. Yep, that's it. That was a bit too easy. We try, we do our best. <laughs> but there's always issues. There's always issues in every live demo, so uh no. I'm definitely saying no to that one. Uh what is the Robusta UI sync? So that's our SaaS platform. I would recommend enabling that for the demo. Uh, me. So do I need to sign up to Robusta SaaS? Uh, yeah, you just put in here. Just yeah. put in an email. You don't need a, so you don't need to set up anywhere else. Just put in a new email. Yeah, that's it. It'll generate it for you. All right. So Robusta can use Prometheus as an alert source. You can install a pre-configured Prometheus. Yes, please. Uh, sure. Okay, so this has generated a Helm values file. Oh, bunch of keys in there. Uh, okay, I'll just show everybody them. That's not important, right? <laughs> no, it's fine. All right, so let's add the Robusta repository and run a Helm update. And then we do an install. And I'll need to change. Do I have a small cluster? No, I don't think so. Yeah. All right. I guess this might just take a wee minute. Yeah, no worries. So what time is it where you're at? Ah, uh, it's seven thirty over here. You? Uh, five thirty. Yeah. Yep. Is it cold where you are? Oh, it's all a matter of perspective. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can't say yes. Uh... Yep, still minus five. Okay. 
Uh, okay, it looks like we're installed. It looks like I can go to platformrobusto.dev for some sort of web UI. And I'm assuming if I run get pods, we'll see some robusta stuff happening. There, there we go. Cool. All right, what do you want me to do next? Uh, let's go back to the docs. And let's just wait, I guess, until the pods are up and running. Um, yeah, so that's just the command there. And then uh, we're going to crash some stuff. Let's break some stuff in your cluster. That I can handle. And, All right. Uh, some fun. You should have also gotten a message on Slack, I believe. Uh, it sends a message just to confirm the Slack channel. So we're going to want to bring up Slack too. All right. Yeah. Don't need you. Or you. So we have all the pods. And then you want me to deploy this thing to break stuff? Yeah, let's deploy a crashing pad. All right, we have a crashing pod. So does this mean I'm going to see something in my Slack channel? You should, yeah. I don't know why that keeps deselecting. You have to huh. wait a moment. We don't send it on the first crash because um, this is exactly the type of thing that you spoke about, right? Like you have these transient issues with Kubernetes and you don't want to alert as soon as something happens that like that second it's going to then disappear. So we try and always find the right balance. What's the point where this is really an issue that you then want to get notified, not just a transient issue. Okay. So we have a high severity crashing pod we have an investigate button it's telling us it's crashed twice this thing crashed it back off and it's collected some logs from the application quite a lot of logs from the application can't believe you put java in my cluster you know i have rules about that right uh yeah actually <laughs> well, do you wanna, okay take a look at what that thing is take a look at uh take a look at the pod that's running Come on, computer. I'm not a monster. I won't put Java in there. Oh, it's busy box, right? Okay. <laughs> it's a busy box command that outputs what, according to Google, was the world's dark, longest Java exception. Well, yeah, the Slack warning told me, do I want to expand this thousand line uh, log message? So it is. Oh, Java experience. Yeah. Oh yeah, that's right. the truncated to 168 lines, so. All right, we have a crashing pod. We got a nice alert. What's next? Okay, so uh, let's go and let's go over now to the demo scenarios repository that I sent you. And let's deploy some more stuff from over there. Cool. So that demo one was just to show the Slack integration is posting something to my my channel. Yep. And now we're going to show an example of a different error that occurs where we pull in different data. So Okay, so these demos then are demos which are going to show off the enrichment process that you covered on the slides and how that gives us more context into what's actually crashing, right? Yeah, exactly. And we've tried to pick the demo scenarios so that they don't actually mess up your cluster. Like I love to show how for example, we have an issue with low disk space, and then we pull in um, like a graph of the disk usage on that node. But if I do that, that's going to actually mess up one of your nodes. Now, in your case, that's OK. But <laughs> we try and demo scenario stuff that won't really mess up a cluster. So um, it's mostly stuff that there's an issue with this specific pod. 
Oh well, yeah, this is just a a cluster for today. So if you want to break it to pieces, it is completely fine by me. Okay, so let's get started with uh, if you go down a little bit, um, then in the README we have there's something about the umkel. That should be the second one. Yep. Okay. So let's just run that from the uh, REPL that you checked out. Oh, I've not cloned it yet. <laughs> oh, no Who's that in the chat that said I'm finally breaking stuff? Hey, LP. Yes, indeed. Uh, all right. So let's apply. Oh, it doesn't exist. I'm just doing what I do best. Oh, a typo. There we go. I'm assuming this is going to be a pod that eats up a whole bunch of memory. Indeed. I'm getting on. So this one is Java then, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's gotta be. So what do you need to see when, when your pod is empty? What, what, what do you, you usually check? Uh, I'll want to check the resource constraints to see what the, the memory limits are set at. And obviously, if I can get some information from Prometheus, I'd normally like to see the tumbling value over the last 30 minutes to see if this was like a blip or if it was you know, gradual yeah. growth, something like that. Yeah, that's that makes sense. Now, we're going to try and like listen to people like you and then gather that information up front and send it to <laughs> you. And then what, what do you get it? Yeah. Well, go over to Slack, see yeah. how we did on this one. <laughs> All right. I've got too many tabs, I don't know when I put anything. There we go. Okay, so we got our high severity pod um kill. Namespace node name. Okay, so we got the node allocated memory, that's useful right off the bat. The container name is memory eater, nice. And we can see the request and a limit right in front of us. So yeah, that's quite a good amount of information up front. I'm assuming it's been on killed because it's hit the 100 meg limit. And then we've got some links. Are these? Oh, that's a binary. Uh, so it's. Oh, it's an SVG. <laughs> yeah, but you can open up the, not the PNG version. Yeah. We're going to knock out those, SVG, those SVGs soon because that right. doesn't run well. Oh, sweet. So we get that tumbling value. So I can actually see that it's quite a, quite a claim. And the node looks okay. Uh, the memory chart for your pod and for your node, and then hopefully it gives you a lot more context on your your umkin pod. Yeah, I see a line, a scaly line. I don't trust this workload anymore. I guess. Now, Sorry, Nico. It's an example that's optimized for demos, but like in a real life scenario, then you'd see spikiness, and then you'd see also if it's going up over time, and then you know there's a memory leak there as well. Yeah, like, you know, if this was a real production application uh, and then something gets own killed, been able to see that memory claim, because you always want to know whether this is just, you know, it's just consistent growth, you know, it's just it's just running over time and maybe we just need to set, we need to restart that pod every six hours or something, which is our hacky fix, but we've all done it, right? Because we have some memory leak, we've not debugged yet. Or it could be that it's just absolute context situation where oh maybe we got a spike of 10,000 users in a 15 minute window and that caused our redis cache to just completely fill up and fall over like you know you, it's not until you start to connect these dots of all these disparate systems within your cluster that you really understand what is actually happening here so exactly yeah so what we're trying to do is make it easier to connect those dots where we can to connect them automatically and where you have dots that you know make sense to connect and to also make it easy for you to connect them I mean, even easy for you to say, okay, well, next time this happens, like, okay, go and restart this pod after five hours before it reaches the six hour mark. When's that 80% mark? So these attachments on, like, I, I, I don't know how this is configured, this trigger and the actions and stuff like that, but can I add new PNGs with different queries against the Prometheus? Is that something that's an option? 
you can indeed. Uh, do you want to go over to the GitHub, the main GitHub for Robusta, and check out the Helm values file? Uh, yes. There we go. Okay. And now over here, let's just go into the Helm folder and then right into the default values file. And look in here for um. This one? Yep, and that's just how it's configured. Okay. What are these special terms in Robusta? Yeah, so we have here three different enrichers. One of them is pulling in that text data that you saw, uh, the pad um killer enricher. The other one is a, a little bit more generic, but it's, it's creating that graph, but it's optimized specifically for the um scenario, so it knows to add on the limits. And then the third one is totally generic. It just says, take this pod, go with whatever node it's running on, and grab their graph of the memory from that node that this pod is running on. Nice. OK. Cool. So I can add more of these. What kind of enrichers are available then to people? Is there a list somewhere? Yep. yep. We have a list of <laughs> documentation. <laughs> and this is the main area, by the way, like that we're really going to focus on in 2023 and making this way easier to navigate and way easier to use. So this is going to be a big focus of ours. Uh, if you look on the left-hand side of the page, then you can find there uh, on the left-hand side of the page in the menu, there's something there that says Actions. Got it. And we have here all these different Actions. And, I and see Node a Bash and Richer. I could have some fun with that one. Yep. <laughs> I'm assuming I could just write a Bash script in line in the YAML, and then does this run it? Or... Yeah, click on the example oh, yeah. config. See that that's awesome, right? Like I used to be an SRE and I used to give talks about how terrible I was at being an SRE, right? Because I used to get alerts at three o'clock in the morning and we had a, a six month old at this time, right? So my wife was already hating the fact that she'd only been asleep for ten minutes and my alerts gone off crazy. So I would always just like grab my laptop and it would be like a disc alert and it'd say, Oh, you're at ninety six percent or whatever. And I would just go on and delete the log directory on a Linux machine. Like, I, because I, I just wanted to go back to sleep, but I never actually spent enough time to work it out and do it properly. But if we had the ability, if I had the ability to just have a bash command and like run like a du h against the directories, do a depth on it, and kind of analyze where the actual consumption is coming from and identify the process, like I could chain a bunch of these bash commands together and I would have all the information I need to actually fix it once and for all instead of just taking the lazy approach. But yeah, that's really cool. I'm glad that's the first one I've seen. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I see there's a comment here in the chat. Um, it, Wind is asking, does it create just Prometheus rules objects in the cluster? So yeah, the answer is uh, yes and no. Um, we do create Prometheus rules in the cluster if you take the default alerts that we provide. And if you already have alert manager running, you already have Prometheus, then you can disable that. You can just say, use my existing alerts. Don't create any rules for me. And then the second part of this is we're not just creating those Prometheus rules. We're taking those, like the Prometheus, uh, Prometheus alerts, and then we're tying them together to like the different context gathering and the runbook automation. So essentially, we're doing two things. We're installing default alerts if you don't already have them, and that does create Prometheus rules. And then the second thing that we always do is we take those alerts and we now pull in the right context. And for that, you, you can't do that with Prometheus alone because it's not just based on time series databases. It's like not just based on looking at time series. It's saying, OK, here's an alert. Look at the labels here. It has this label saying that it's running on this node. Go run this bash command on that node, and so on. Nice. So a big part of what we do is not only building the platform that enables to do that, but we also want to collect the community knowledge. So if you have some insight about some specific alert and you know as someone who, who is specialized in that what exactly you need to do you can actually contribute your own playbook and even your own alert and then everyone else can enjoy the the benefit of it it's about taking it's like you said at the beginning right like you have all the data there and you're trying to find the signal and the noise so what we're saying is like okay if you're running on kubernetes we all actually have this very similar alerts anyway because we're all alerting 
on these different scenarios. Um, it, there's like known issues with the nodes, then we're all learning on these same common scenarios. So why not also share the investigation for that? Why not share that as community knowledge? Nice. All right, let me scan what other ones we have here. So, the node graph enricher. Everybody loves a good graph, right? Pod bash. Does this run up? Execute a uh, command inside the pod? It does. So you would put that if you have an alert that fires on a specific pod, then that would execute on the pod where that alert fires. Yeah, and send you the result to the Slack or whatever you define. Okay. All right. There's quite a lot of choice here. I'm not going to scroll through <laughs> all of these, but there's uh, definitely a lot of flexibility in the enrichers that we can add. And that was just, was that just the event ones? There's like remediation stuff. And yep. So when Pain this alert fire is going to be the problem. Python yeah. troubleshoot. But when this happens. All right. There's loads. <laughs> All right, shall we take a look at another example? Yep, let's go back for a second to the demo repository. I think we'll look at one last example that will be good to generate the concept. And I want to take here, uh, let me go down a little bit, uh, just a little bit more. Yeah, I want to take here an example with pending pods. So skip the next one, the CPU throttling we can skip. Uh, just like the um, um kill and you'll pull, pull in the relevant data. And yeah, let's take care of the pending pods one. Right, I'll clean up after myself. I think it's gone. Now, the pending pods is an interesting one because what we're trying to do is we're trying to give everyone the best out of the box experience. And that means it's things we have to make decisions about what we alert on, right? Because let's say you have a normal healthy cluster and you have an auto scaler defined. A pending pod isn't necessarily a big deal because the auto scaler will fix it. You spin up a new node, it takes a few minutes. And then once you spin up that new node, now everything is fine, right? Like the pod won't be pending anymore. So for pending pods, you actually don't want to alert on that right away. So by default out of the box, we don't send you an alert right when the pending pod happens. We wait 15 minutes and then we send it if that hasn't been resolved. And then we give the auto scaler a chance to do that. But if you have pods that are pending, you still want to get some form of visibility into that. So that also ties into what we're doing in the SaaS platform, where here's a scenario where we don't want to alert you on it. But if you're going and you're checking, you're saying, okay, well, I just deployed what's going on. We still want to give you that visibility even before it becomes an issue. Okay. Does that mean we're sitting here for 15 minutes? No, I was thinking we could open up. Uh, I, I was thinking we could open up uh, the SaaS platform, and then we will also tie that into some other stuff uh, that we didn't show off, and that we that's in the open source as well, but that we didn't show off. All right. How does one get to the robust SaaS platform? I guess you the should. login button. Yep. Now, because I just typed in my email address and I don't have an account, if I click Google lot off, is it going to work? Yeah. Yep. Right, I think I will need to move this to the right profile, though. Are you going to hack me? <laughs> I don't think you get access to do anything meaningful. No, it's just... Uh... It's just OAuth. All right, it was just a very random uh, subdomain string on that super base thing there. Yeah. Uh, all right, so what do we have here? I don't think I've seen the SaaS platform before. Did we look at this last time? Uh, I don't know, and if we did, it looked totally different. <laughs> all right, why don't you give us the guided tour? Okay, so let's click, um, let's say, on... Uh, let's take, uh, what's a good place to take? Let's just take one, any one of these. Take GKE metrics agent. Yep. And now 
you can see here, there was a transient issue, but it fixed itself. There was some issue with the mount that self-resolved. So that's just debug priority under the priority there. We're saying this wasn't important. It happened, you might want to know about it, but it wasn't important. And now if you jump over to the pod screen for a second, then one thing that we can do is we can let you pull in different data here um, from what's running in your cluster. Um, it, but for security reasons, we want you to generate a token that's specific to your browser. Um, so to give it like access to do that. I think you need just uh, step three. Yeah. Oh yeah, I've already used my context, right? So I don't need to worry about that. Mm -hmm. I can just do this. Okay. So what happened? Um, it, it, okay, so we generated a token so that Robusta will have access to pull in a little bit of data, very limited data that it pulls from Robusta itself um, it, about what's going on in your cluster. And that will let it pull into the SaaS platform some uh, graphs like about different metrics, CPU usage, and so on, and to get logs. Okay, so the Robusta that we installed to the cluster, does that have any permissions to this stuff? Does it speak to the SaaS platform? Are they completely independent? Like, what's the relationship between those two components? Yeah, so it depends on whether you enable it or don't enable it. So if you start off and you check off at the beginning that you don't want to enable the SaaS platform, then nothing gets sent. And if you check off that you do want to enable the SaaS platform, then we're sending just metadata there, uh, like alerts, uh, crashing pods, so data about what's happening. And it's all with a push model. Now, when you go into the UI, though, you might want to see data there. Like you might want to see a data, OK, what is the pod log right now? And in order to enable that, then you have to explicitly give permission there. OK. And is this a short-lived token? Or is this something I should be cleaning up after a certain amount of time? Does it have an expiration? Uh, this is a token that you can remove from the UI itself afterwards. It's not a Kubernetes token or anything. So it doesn't have any Kubernetes meaning. Um, it just has meaning in Robusta itself to authorize your computer. OK, got it. Cool. So now we get some information about the, the pod itself, right? So we can see the CPU and memory consumption. And we can see that there's more than one of them. Mm -hmm. Yep. And if you wanted, then you could pull in from here, uh, the logs, for example, you can see different data. And one thing that's cool about this is we're doing this on all your different clusters. So even if this was a microservice that was running on 300 different clusters, you would still get a single pane of glass to see all those different um, clusters in one single place. Nice. But let's go back to that transient issue we were speaking about. We were saying, okay, how sometimes there's this issue that occurs that's a transient issue. So just click here on the timeline page on the left. Am I on it? Oh, no, that's, that's, that's fine. Got it. <laughs> yep. And then you can see here, um, we can go in here and we can see some of these transient issues. So um, I'm going to want you to, can you go first, just zoom in a little bit with your scroll bar on the right hand side of this graph. If you use your scroll bar on the right hand on the graph itself, put your mouse over the graph. Yeah, and then you can zoom in. Yeah, you can drag it as well. <laughs> zoomed in a little bit too much. Yeah. Uh, oh. Never trust me with a mouse. This is what I'm learning today. All right, hold on. And if I zoom in, right, there we go. Is this what you wanted? Yeah, so see that icon on the top row? Mm -hmm. yep. Yeah, so if you click there, then that's an example. Yeah, just click on that. Oh, I just want to make sure I understand what I'm seeing here. So this, these are the different types of things, events within my Kubernetes cluster. This yeah. is a timeline of when these events happen. I don't understand what the colors are yet, but that's okay. And this change one is not like the others. Why is that? Because this is a special event? Is it got some significance? This comes from the API server. 
you so we're it. tracking a list of all the different changes that happen. What I would do is go and run kubectl edit on a deployment or a pod or something in your cluster, even that crash pod. And we're using the UI here to show this, but you could do this even without the UI. Like what we're doing here when we're tracking all these changes, this is based on kubewatch. And all the functionality here, it's important to emphasize, it's also in the open source. So the UI is just a, like a thin layer on top. We can change the, like the time range for one hour. It will be like, uh, yeah. Yeah, up a little bit above that. I'm just going to start playing with all the sentences now. Mm -hmm. Yep. Maybe hit the refresh button there. Um, Have I broke it? Uh, let's I might not get the label, the metadata change. Maybe that was just a silly change. I'll delete the pod. No, I want to do a change. The deletion will definitely pick up one, but do a change. Maybe go back to the change. Yeah, do uh, edit pods or edit deployment. Did you change the pod or the deployment? I changed the labels on the pod. So try changing the deployment. We might, if the pod is part of a deployment, we might only look at the deployment there. Uh, so let's change the replicas, right? This is probably a change I'd want to be able to visualize. Okay, and I'll give that one moment. Ah, uh, well, what can you do about the demo gods? <laughs> um, what can you do? Um, can you check what's in your robust on your logs? Yeah, sure. Uh, do deployment slash robust on there. Yeah. Oh. No, I think that's okay. Yeah, I don't think it's that. It should appear in the UI, I guess, in a few seconds. Go back to the UI and let's see if it appeared yet. Okay, so I'll I'll look into that a little bit <laughs> afterwards. Let me go back. Uh, me go back to the home page over here. Yep, and you added a crash pod, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, I did, yes. So if you click here, uh, me. I'll have to take a look later on and yeah. see what's going on there. Well, it's noticed that it's not scaled up. Yep, that is true. Um, I'll need to check and see uh, what's going on with the change over there. But let's go back for a second now. Um, just go back to the main app screen. Uh, me. So we just go on the left over to the app screen. Yep. Now, remember we put here this example pod that was going to go into pending state. So uh -huh. just open it up. And if you go down here and you look at the warning, then you can see here, okay, it failed scheduling. And we're pulling in here the reasons why it failed scheduling. So you can see here that it failed to be scheduled because three nodes didn't match the pods node selector. Uh-huh. And what we're doing here is we're pulling in the output of kubectl events to show you the data on what's going on. You know, this is a transient issue. We're still showing you the data on why this is happening. Yeah, nice. That's quite a nice UI. Uh, thank you. <laughs> I'm going to have our, also our UI UX design look at this tomorrow, and then she'll go over this often and she'll pick pick out the things where uh, you didn't click on the things she thought you would click on, and we'll do improvements on that. So that's always useful. Yeah, I think my Zoom is causing problems, but yeah. I like this kind of level of visibility into everything. I like this timeline view. I think that's very clever. And um, yeah, understanding why the pod isn't scheduling. Like, is this something that you expect to, like, 
hypothetical question here because I don't know if it does this just now. I don't know if it's going to do this in the future, etc. But I wonder if a pod fails the schedule and it's because of, uh, you know, the CPU or the memory request can't be satisfied by a member in a cluster, then we could probably expect that pending status, which kicks off the cluster autoscaler, will eventually work. But this one was an affinity selector. Like, does, does Reposita know that there are no nodes with those matching criteria? And can it, can, can it handle that differently? Is that what it's doing already? Yeah, so we don't have that resolution yet today, but what we've done is we've built out like the language where we can express that resolution. And a big part of what we're doing in 2023 is to handle, like increase our coverage on each of those fine edge cases. Yeah, because, you know, it could be, especially with, with node topologies and different architectures and GPUs now, there's probably a lot of things that you can just make assumptions about. Like if there are no GPUs in the, the cluster, maybe there's never going to be any GPUs in the cluster. And if there's no nodes and EU East 1, maybe it's because we never deployed to EU East 1 and someone's just copy and pasted some crappy YAML from the internet into their cluster. Like, these are probably yeah. things you could surface relatively quickly for people. And it doesn't require a lot of knowledge of their cluster. You can make certain assumptions, I guess, based on the, the complete lack of a certain criteria. Yeah, I think this is a really interesting space where you can deliver a lot of real value to people with some very simple kind of checks like that. So that that's cool. I really like this. Yeah. The, it's kind of like open sourcing the operations. It's like taking how you work <coughs> and sourcing like the way that we actually think and we handle this. Right? Like ultimately this is just a rule in the in the repository that's written in YAML. And we're like taking the knowledge out of your head for how you would handle this error and now turning it into code. It's almost like infrastructure as code said, okay, you shouldn't set up servers ad hoc. And what we're doing is we're doing incident response as code and saying like you shouldn't respond to Incidents ad hoc either. Okay. Nice. All right. We've still got a whole bunch of tabs on the robust SaaS. Do you want to dive into any of them? I see we've got jobs, nodes, comparison, health, silences. Is there anything here you would like to show off? Ah, uh, Arik, anything you want to emphasize? Um, no. We're constantly adding and uh, adding. <laughs> also, the help world is new. To just give you like a one, if you have a lot of clusters, to give you a single overview of everything over there. The silences, um, it, when there's a Prometheus alert, then we add there a silence button in Slack. So with one click, you can silence alerts directly from Slack. And then that shows up in the silences screen. Hmm. So tell me a couple more things then about the, the SaaS platform. For people that want to get started and start using it, is there a free tier? Um, how do they get started? Is it as simple as what we've shown today? Maybe you can give them a little bit more detail. Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, me, so very extensive free tier. Uh, me, we currently have our free tier up to 50 nodes. Uh, me, so that's 50, five zero. Yeah. yeah, you seem in shock. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, I just, yeah, it's, it's, it's not a lot of nodes. You know, obviously the clusters get much, much bigger than this. But I think it's, it's rare, or maybe it's just the people that are calling me asking for help, is that their clusters are normally in that kind of 8 to 12, maybe 20 an absolute push. So like, that is a very generous three tier. Yeah, yep. we know that. Yep, we know. We're not <laughs> guaranteeing that we will forever have 50 uh, nodes on there. Although, if someone adds things on in advance, um, and they're already on like Robusta, then we do try and like at least be thoughtful. Like if people, if we ever change the tier, we will try and be thoughtful of people who are also there beforehand. Um, and is there a limit on how many clusters of up to 50 nodes I can have on my account? No, we don't want to force you in that regard. You can deploy however you want. You want like to split everything up into clusters. That's fine. You want to put everything on one mega cluster. That's your choice. That shouldn't affect, like our software shouldn't affect how you choose to deploy. So I could have 10 clusters with 49 nodes each and that's still free tier? Or have I misunderstood? Is it 50 nodes total? 50 nodes yeah. total. Ah, okay. Yeah, okay. That makes a lot more sense. All right. Yeah. I just assumed I could have an infinite amount of clusters with 50 nodes. But that was just me. I mean, All you right. could technically create a different account for each one. And like, we probably we wouldn't go after you. But, um... but I think the value add from what I'm seeing so far is this multi-cluster pane of glass. Like, you know, this UI with apps and timeline and jobs. We've got all the debugging information there. We've got alerts. Like, you know, multi-cluster is definitely a growing 
popular way of running Kubernetes, lots of smaller clusters. And that single pane of glass is still a, a kind of missing piece of the puzzle so far, um, especially as it comes to actually being able to apply run books or logic or conditional statements to those clusters, rather than just have a graph on Grafana that can filter by the cluster. Um, so yeah, exactly. I, I think where you're going with this, I like the direction and I'm very excited to see this. Um, so yeah. There's a question too, I think also about uh, that you can also ready route alerts with Grafana. So the big part of what we're doing here is to not just route the alerts to the right destination, but to pull in the right context. Um, like if I go back to that example with the radioactive box that I started off with, then like you want to find out that there's a radioactive box there, but you also want to find out what that box means and to see the context there as fast as possible. So our goal is to pull in the right data and show you all the right data at the right time, um, not just to do the other routing, which um, you can obviously do on your own as well. Cool. All right, if anyone else has any more questions, feel free to drop them into the comment section and we'll pass them on before we finish for today. All right, so as far as what we've looked at today, we've got all these options for enrichers. Um, if I want to start going rogue on this and doing my own thing, what's the best place to get examples? Uh, in the docs. So if you go to the docs, then we have examples there on configuring the enrichers, and we have examples on writing your own enrichers too. So for example, you could do an enricher that takes an alert and um, it asks, asks uh, GPT, sorry, chat GPT, what you should do to solve that alert and then sends it on to the Slack channel or to Discord. So you could do that, something like that if you wanted. Have you already done that demo? I haven't. I uh. wish I had. If someone does that demo though, we will send you uh, swag to your house. We will send you swag um, and special swag. I will, I will send you a custom swag that no one else in the world has ever gotten. If you care about <laughs> asks chat GPT. I think that would be generally awesome. Like, I think we've all seen enough of these chat GPT things on Twitter now where people are filling it with a bunch of context and then asking questions based on that new information. And you could totally do that with Robusta. Like, here's the logs for my application and here is the scheduling problems for this pod. Like, what is the remediation path here? Thanks. And it would probably tell you, oh, you need to go and spin up a node with a GPU on it or you need to tweak your requests and limits, etc. Like, we actually have an enricher that uh, runs the search on uh, Stack Overflow. So this will be an enhanced version of that. Do you want to try and configure one that runs the search on Stack Overflow? <laughs> Does that work? I, I think so. I mean, hmm. let's, let's, go, let's go with the actions. Uh-huh. And um, I'll just say in the meantime, I think it's under event enrichment. Either event enrichment or miscellaneous. Just look here for Stack Overflow. Yep, Stack Overflow yep. enricher. And in the meantime, I'm just going to say to Wind, um, excellent questions. So thank you very much. Um, and also, we're on Stack stuff, and we have a community. So if you have any questions, always reach out. OK, now take care of the example config. And yep. And so you're just going to copy this. Copy mm -hmm. the whole thing. Oh, the whole thing. And now we're going to add this to the, your Helm values. So you have to now change the Helm values. And uh, you should have where you have the generated values. And we just add on a new value here called custom playbooks. I think, yeah. C U S T O M. Yep, playbooks. Yep, and just pop this in here. Uh, but just make that like a member of an array. Custom playbooks is an array. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Exactly. And then you have to indent all of this. Look that, right? No. Uh, the triggers, yeah, should be, the triggers should be backspaced. No, the triggers. Yeah. Backspace two backspaces on that line and the line after it. Yeah. On triggers and on Prometheus. Yeah. That's it. And oh yeah, actions <laughs> and then trigger. All right, okay, gotcha, gotcha. Right. See, YAML's and, hard. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so just um, save this into a Helm. Upgrade. Okay. In fact, do I still have my home command here? And I'll need to change this. Oh, no, don't do it again. Uh, helm upgrade dash dash install. Is that going to be enough? Yep. Perfect.
So now when we cause some sort of failure scenario, it looks up, the, it does a search for Stack Overflow with some of the information and then tries to give me a response? Something like that, yeah. We'll, we'll see you in action. <laughs> I mean, I'm hoping you don't just copy and paste the commands from Stack Overflow and paste them into my cluster. Although that would be no, funny. No, we're not going to do that. <laughs> this is actually one of the first enrichers I wrote to kind of play around with the concept myself. And mostly as a toy, like not as a real production use case, but uh, it's interesting to show the concept. Well, let's go to Robusta. So where's the code for the enrichers? So go into playbooks. And then we have here, there should be one in here called Stack Overflow. Uh, let's see, maybe, so try. Want well, search? Yeah, try doing a search on Stack Overflow. Yep, there we go, there's integration. So line 262. Okay, so I can add chat GPT and 25 lines of code, hopefully. <laughs> exactly, but, yeah. Because I, I actually have played with the chat GPT API, and it is just a, a regular request you're making to an endpoint with some context. So, I mean, we could totally make that work. Not that I'm suggesting we try and do it right now, but I think this demo needs to exist and has yeah. to exist soon. So. Like a good idea. If you do this, our, our offer stands. We will send you some incredible customized one-off swag that no one else in the world has. Consider and it done. Only, only that, <laughs> the, the text on the shirt we will generate with ChatGPT. I will ask ChatGPT to give me <laughs> the appropriate quote for the shirt to send you. All right. I mean, we could just have ChatGPT <laughs> take over the stream as well, I'm pretty sure. Just. <laughs> write, write a script to show off robust a demo and improving your Prometheus monitoring and alerting. Uh, yep. We have deployed the Stack Overflow thing, I think. So how how do we check? If we have a utility in the CLI that generates a demo alert, so uh, you run a Robusta uh, demo minus alert. So it takes a random pod from the cluster and create a, an alert manager alert on that. And then within a few minutes, you should be able, you should get a new message on Slack. That I believe arrived, uh, yeah, that arrived beforehand. That's not from right now. So just give it a moment. You have alert manager silences. So it, sorry, alert manager wait period. So it mm -hmm. takes a moment. Yeah, this one's from six minutes ago, so we just need to be be patient. Yep. Are you all the you're all the way scrolled down there, right? Yeah. Okay. It's just cool. it's just, so, just a weird. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So while we're waiting, though, I'll say, okay, here's an alert. So see how how there's that silence button at the top of the alert. So I used to get live alerts in Stack. And then sometimes I want to silence them, but it was like annoying to do, or I had multiple clusters that I'd have to go and silence them on. So sometimes I didn't really do what I should have. And sometimes I didn't silence them and I would just get that same alert every six hours. So we've tried to make it really easy to silence. And even if you have like 10 different clusters, each with their own Prometheus and alert manager, then you can push out with one click that silence to all the different clusters. And we pre-fill all the boxes here. It's really like trying to encourage you to silence something if it's noisy. You need a oh, just... mm -hmm. oh no, but if you silence this, we're going to silence the alert that <laughs> you have to delete it. We're going to silence the alert that we were trying to simulate. It's the same one? Yeah. And I've heard from Pawan Gudiwada that we will have 100 GitHub stars uh, at some point during this stream. A thousand. Sorry, 1,000 GitHub yeah. stars. At some point during the stream, we're currently on 999. So if you're the lucky person who gets this thousand star, then uh, send it to us and we will send you a t-shirt. Oh, I've already started it. Drats. Whoever gets the thousand star, just screenshot it 
and post it on Twitter afterwards. Uh, tag me, tag uh, David, and we will send you a t-shirt. All right, someone get out there, win that t-shirt. Let's see. Well, we still don't have our Stack Overflow alert just yet. Okay, let's check the dogs. And someone just got a t-shirt. Um, I don't know who, but someone just got the t-shirt, so congrats. Hey! <laughs> nice. Uh, okay, okay, so let's... we think there's a problem? Um, I don't know. Let's jump over. Let's check the Robusta dogs. From the runner? Yep. Yep. Uh, congratulations, JS. We got that t-shirt. All right. Well um, done. Yeah, I don't see any issue here. So, um, maybe we just need to wait a couple of more minutes until uh, alert manager will fire it. There's default alert manager silences. Mm -hmm. So it's not silences, uh, wait periods. So when you send an alert, depending on your configuration, it actually takes some time for the alert to arrive. Um, let me see. I'm trying to think if there's a different way we could simulate yeah, it well, faster. Uh, yeah, maybe. Um, we have an alert simulation playbook you can take it. it that's not what the demo alert does? No, it creates an, an alert on the alert manager. Oh, well, that's why we have to wait the period. Mm -hmm. Okay, so can you send him the command then for yeah. the... We're going to send you a way that does it faster. Oh, it's here, it. it's here. Woo. And now if you click the button, the search stack overflow for... So this also shows like how playbooks can be interactive. Here's an example of a playbook that's taking an action. You can also automatically remediate stuff when you click that button. You can do it different ways. I think it would be really cool to have chat GPT. Yes. Yeah, whoever chat GPT is getting the prize, I'm telling you. <laughs> hey, this stream's done. I've got some code to write. <laughs> <laughs> I'll point everyone in the right direction. Okay, so go over to the Robusta docs. And there's a tutorial there on the left that says custom automation. And that tutorial shows you how to write your own playbook and to load it into Robusta. And the source code, of course, um, so the source code for this, can you drop in the source code for the Stack Overflow one so people know what they can go and copy? Or you can drop that into the chat. Which one? The Stack Overflow one. Mm, yeah. I think David's going to do it anyway. Okay. Uh, David <laughs> might do that else. <laughs> So it's just some Python code. So nice and easy for people to work with web APIs and pass in the data. I'm assuming this event event, which I'm loving the name of and hating it every much the same at the same time. <laughs> yep. Does, does this <laughs> get event, event, get event. Uh, does that have all of that enrichment that was previously done? Like what, what, what do they have access to? And obviously we've got type, we've got reason, but does it have the logs? Does it have the request and memory limits from the other enricher? Like what, what do we have access to within this? So each enricher is independent and each right. enricher has access. It depends on the event there. And I know event event has a really awkward name, um, but what event event represents like, okay, what you would normally see there isn't event event. What you would normally see is pod event or deployment event. And in this case, it's really a, an event that happened on a Kubernetes event. You're listening to kubectl event. So I know that's a super awkward name and like, I'm sorry about that. <laughs> but um, what you would, so what you would have access to on the event object depends on um, like what it is. So if you're looking at a pod event, you can access the logs. If you're looking at a Prometheus event, then you can access the pod that's associated with that. You can access the Prometheus labels, the alert name and all the different stuff. And you have auto complete, of course. So you'll just be able to see there what's available. Nice. All right, I'll be playing with that later on. So I think we've shown a lot here. We deployed Robusta. We've used the SaaS platform. We've poked around our cluster. We caused a couple of failure scenarios. We've seen the messages come into Slack. We've seen that those are interactive. We did the Slack overflow one. We did the silences. There's, there's a lot of value from people deploying Robusta to the cluster. So maybe if you're happy to, you could tell us like, what are you working on? What's coming next? How are you going to take Robusta to the next level? Oh, so let me open up my slides and I'm going to show exactly that. Sorry, is there anything else you want to show on, on my side before we do that? Like, I didn't mean to. Uh... No, 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 no. I think that's... <laughs> 
All right, your slides are now live. Take it away. Okay, so I'll, I'll speak briefly on what we've done since we were last here. So what we did is a live coverage. So like lots and lots of stuff to cover all these different things, all these different scenarios and add these playbooks for them. And the second thing we did was to add the live destinations. So last time you were here, you could send stuff to, I think, just Slack. And we added on MS Teams and Discord and PagerDuty and Cisco WebEx and Ops Genie and all these other destinations. Um, so those were the two main things that we worked on here, um, as well as improvements to the SaaS platform. But those were the main improvements in the open source since we were last on the stream. And what we're going to be working on in the next year is more coverage. So it's <laughs> covering different types of stuff. Um, major improvements to developer experience, so to make it even easier to update the playbook definitions. And I edited in my slides while you were talking. So uh, I think we're going to get chat GPT uh, from David Flynn again, uh, they, from our favorite raw code. And uh, there will be some more surprises coming, more stuff that we're going to work on. We're very driven by feedback we get. So like it, uh, the old saying goes, uh, like, send us all your weary and tired alerts. So like, tell us what's going on in your clusters. Tell us what you want automated away. Tell us what issues you saw that happened in your cluster that were annoying to investigate. And uh, those will go into their own map. Tell us if you want to send alerts to uh, different destinations that we don't support today. Like that's why we support now uh, PagerDuty and Apps Genie. And of course, we've gotten a lot of contributions there from the community who have open PR requests as well. So um, I think that's everything. Um, there's some more stuff I could talk about, but I think those are the main things. Awesome. Thank you. All right, let me pop us back over to here. So thank you for, sorry, were you, are you not done? Oh, say to JS, um, I, I, want, I need to get your address and stuff. So message me afterwards on Twitter and it's already late here. So I'll probably reply to you tomorrow, but message me on Twitter and then I'll put you in touch uh, with my aunt from our team and you'll get some uh, swag. Yeah, definitely drop him a DM, get that swag. Oh. All right. Well, thank you both for joining me today. It's been fun taking a look at Robusta again. It's always great to see where these projects are going and the speed and the velocity that these projects are kind of evolving at. So it's just nice to, to see that you're making people's Kubernetes lives a little bit easier. So thank you again for taking the time. Any last words before we finish up for today? Oh, there is a fun remark. I, I think, but I think last time that Arik and I were here, then there was someone in the chat who we noticed and who was creating excellent content on Twitter and who we subsequently added to our team, uh, Pawan Gudiwada. So I think, <laughs> uh, <laughs> I think that's like a good closing the circle. I think Pawan was here as part of the community last time, and now he's also here as part of the team, um, maybe next time also on the screen with us. So um, I, I guess, it's good to say, like, we're doing our best to really build our open source community. And we are always hiring as well. So if this sort of thing interests you, then uh, please reach out. We're hiring for front end positions. We're hiring for a lot of different stuff. So um, my DMs are open. Yeah, JS, just include your CV or your resume when you're requesting your swag t-shirt. You never know. <laughs> yes, 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 please. <laughs> and Pawan has been doing excellent work on the Robusta team. Uh, we also have the uh, widest Kubernetes thing now uh, that we're doing together. So um, sometimes interesting some stuff comes out of these streams. Well, yeah, it's, it's nice that we get the opportunity to share knowledge with each other and with others. And then for the people that, you know, want to get more involved, there's always opportunities. You know, open source is one of the most welcoming places to get involved and start contributing. It doesn't take any prerequisites. And especially, I've got to say, the Kubernetes and Cloud Native ecosystem are some of the most welcoming communities I've ever had the honor of kind of participating in. So. Yeah. It's like, you know, that old joke that on the internet, no one knows you're a dog. No, I don't know that joke. <laughs> I think it's a famous New Yorker, um, I think it's a famous New Yorker comic strip, but it's so true, especially with open source. Like it doesn't matter who you are or where you are, or even what age you are. I first got involved in open source when I was uh, 14 years old and I was like a little kid who didn't go outside enough and <laughs> Then the next thing I knew it, Red Hat was like flying me out to different hackathons and conferences. And it's really one of the incredible things about open source, that ability to really connect people and to like be judged based on the merit of your code, not on your background, not on what country you live in. Like none of it even matters with open source. It all just melts away. So um, thank you, David, for like 
helping also to organize this event and this stream. And um, I think at least one person like is in, who was in the community, uh, we became closer to also due to a stream like this. So thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Awesome. All right. Well, thank you both again for your time. It's been a pleasure. I'm sure we'll speak again soon. And until next time, we'll be back. Have a great day, everyone. Watching Warcode Live.